the backgrounds and the questions I'm looking to answer. Uh, what traits do Oteroidae species have that make them vulnerable or and resilient to climate change? That, and I would like to get some information which would help me further develop a conservation plan that best figures out how to utilize Oteroidae's trait-based capacity to um, Sorry. best persist under environmental changes. So the IUCN Red List has 21 Oteroidae. The good news is 12 of those species are categorized as least concerned, and their numbers are increasing, and it's flourishing, which is great. Alternatively, the other ones that are not categorized as least concerned, their numbers are declining, making them high risk. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the near-threatened species, the stellar sea lion. Moving on to the vulnerable, we have the Peruvian fur seal and the northern fur seal. Moving on down to our endangered species, we have the Galapagos fur seal, the western stellar sea lion, the, uh, the Australian sea lion, the New Zealand sea lion, and the Galapagos sea lion. Now unfortunately, we do have a sea lion that got extinct in the 1960s. And although the direct um, threats were due to human activity, which was exploitation, they still did have some indirect threats that were uh, considered climate change. Now, why do we care about Oteroidae? Well, they're an indicator species. So how do they, how are they indicator species? Well, so fur seals and sea lions are very, very, um, sorry, they are very much affected by uh, the conditions in um, the, sorry. They're very much affected by uh, major and minor And because they're an upper trophic um, marine predator, everything that they eat and their population, uh, their population is mostly going to be affected through lower trophic uh, species. That and then obviously it's known that human activity has been uh, pushing and exhausting the earth. And then third is unlike terrestrial species, marine mammals do not have the ability to pick up and move into new habitats. Their habitat is very limited. They have, they only have the ocean. Now, the traits that I'm looking at are the adult body mass and length. So the smallest uh, Oteroidae is only up to 70 kilograms, and it ranges up to the three uh, stellar sea lions, ranging up to 1,000 kilograms, which is a massive animal. And then we move on to the generation times, which if you look at the first and sea lions, they're about neutral 10 to 11. And then we look at the number of offsprings per litter per year. So every Oteroidae species has one, um, one litter, one pup per year, except for the Australian sea lion, which has a non-annual uh, gestation cycle, producing 17 to 18 months, which makes them more vulnerable. We look at the extinct area and the occupancy of where they live, and I put berries up here just because it's a bunch of numbers and it's better to look at some cute pictures of sea lions. And so that varies based off the population and then also the spatial area. Now on this population size and the lifespan, we, I put up the two uh, extremes. So we have the, le the least abundant, which is only 3,000 New Zealand sea lions, and then we have the most abundant, over 1 million Afro Australian fur seals. Now up here, I'm gonna compare the two. We can tell by the chart that the mass of the sea lion is much greater than the mass of the fur seal. However, you look at the lifespan, and the sea lion's lifespan is a little bit greater than the first little lifespan. Makes it a little bit more resilient. However, you look at the uh, climate change threats, the sea lion has zero climate change threats, which is interesting because it is considered endangered and it only has 3,000 mature adults. Compared to the Afro-Australian fur seal, it has four climate change threats. So this is why I'm not only categorizing them based off their traits, but I'm also categorizing them based off their climate change threats. Now to tell you a little bit about a story that happened in 1997 to 1998, it's a factual story, you can look it up. So there's a little <laughs> thing called El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this is a true event, it is unpredicted and it happens. So this has to do with upwelling. What is upwelling? Well, upwelling is a natural occurrence that happens if, uh, when trade winds come from the inland out to the ocean, it pushes the warm water that has no nutrients 
out into the ocean. And so whatever, and so the warm water is going out to the ocean. And what is replacing this warm water is cool nutrient water. So what this nutrient cool water does is it replaces the nutrients, allows algae to go grow, allows plankton to come in, fish eat the plankton, ultraria eat the fish. That's the way it goes. That's normally what happens. However, when El Nino occurs, the trade winds are so weak that the warm water is staying where it's at. And so this is causing prey distribution to stay near the offshore and, sorry, not stay near offshore and be further away. So it turns out that Ultraiodide mothers have a hard job. They have two jobs. While they're lactating, they're also foraging. Um, so that makes them even more vulnerable to climate change. So it happened in 1997 to 1998 in the Galapagos Islands, it affected the fur seals and sea lions. So cubs were just sitting out, they leave them on the offshore, and that's where they go while the mothers forage out. So because the nutrients were not right there offshore and they were further than they usually are, the fur seals were having to fur, uh, forage longer and further amount of time than the pups are usually used to. And so this caused a uh, pup starvation and a decline mortality from 13% all the way up to 100%. Every pup that year in 1997 to 1998 died off. And um, sorry, ultra species are so adaptable that they just kind of the next year this followed through and they thought this was gonna happen again and so they uh, changed their habitat behaviors. So that's just a very extreme overall threat that can happen. Going on to our research, what I'm looking at is I'm taking oceanic layers I'm putting them into distribution uh, softwares, and then I'm looking at future predictions. I wanna look at the population, I'm looking at the sea surface temperature, really, is it really, how is it being affected if we increase the ambient temperature, if we limit their prey distribution, we're gonna look at the future predictions. And then overall, while I'm here, why I'm talking to you, I'm looking for all of this to help create a conservation plan. My conservation plan is gonna be completely shaped to the species vulnerabilities and resilience. And so just a little bit about a uh, conservation plan, which I'm sure you know, most conservation plans fail whenever they're not adapted around the animal that they're actually looking to protect. And so that's why I'm looking at their traits, I'm looking at the climate change threats, and I'm going to uh, build all of that into a conservation plan. Now, just because we're limited on time, just one little idea that I have for a conservation plan would be a no-take zone. What is a no-take zone? Well, if 1990, uh, yeah, 1999, we were to implement this at the Galapagos Islands, a no-take zone basically means fisheries management cannot take from that area. So that means they can't take that food. That is not your fish to take. And so therefore, that is creating a definite food supply for these animals that are still trying to flourish and their population that is trying to grow. And so all of this, this is just one plan I have, and then of course, this is still a work in progress, and so um, with that, I'd like to say my name is Azalea Rodriguez, and thank you for listening.